Hi, I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Melissa Parrish. Your co-host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by VP and Principal Analyst Terry Flaherty and VP Research Director Mike Pregler to discuss why a focus on individual leads is failing marketing and sales teams and what they should do instead. Welcome both. Thanks, Jen. It's great to be here. Thank you, Jen. So let's take a step back. What are the market dynamics? What's happening in the world today, in the world of lead management? Why are we having this conversation to begin with? So we're kind of at an inflection point in the market. And it's been happening, I would say, over the last five years, right? where uh, historically in the past, most organizations have been focused on individual leads. A lot of times they're called marketing qualified leads, right? And uh, the marketing qualified lead is is produced by marketing, right? They drive interactions with people and they apply scoring to say, hey, this looks like something that we think is really good that we want to send to humans, be it our business development rep or, or send it to sales. And, and uh, so that's been the process for I think since like 1998 is when we first started seeing this concept of a marketing qualified lead. And uh, there's been some changes over the last, you know, like I said, five years or so where um, kind of two things are happening. Uh, one is more and more focus on, on understanding and thinking about accounts and saying, hey, rather than just randomly going and, and doing marketing out to industries and out to individuals, we're going to start thinking about the concept of uh, target accounts and trying to drive a lot of engagement across multiple different people in the account. Um, but very closely related to that, it's also an evolution beyond accounts to think about this concept of buying groups and, and think about the concept of opportunity. So we're at this major inflection point, as I said, where we're seeing a change, um, which is good, of organizations moving away from individual marketing qualified leads, um, thinking about you know a bigger picture view to say, hey, we, we really want to redefine what it is that we're sharing between marketing and our qualification team and sales. And what we're seeing is that transition is really focused on the concept of opportunities and the concept of buying groups. So what has brought about this inflection point? Why are people uh, starting to evolve their approaches? Why are these um, sort of old school approaches failing people at this point? Well, well, Melissa, one of the challenges, if you think about it from a sales perspective, as a sales leader, we see sales leaders that are being challenged by their boards, by their CEOs to deliver that revenue or bookings target consistently and predictably. So of course, what they have to do is look upwards into their funnel and make sure that they've got a funnel, a a pipeline that they've got a lot of confidence in. And so they're looking to their marketing counterparts that how how can we develop that pipeline where we've got a lot of confidence in it? Uh, And then that their reps, the sales leaders' reps, uh, are able to really meet customers where they are within their buyer's journey, which that's changing as well. So now we've got a different dynamic about where reps are meeting buyers in that buyer's journey. Right. And and, and it's even kind of bigger than reps meeting buyers. It, it, it's also really trying to align marketing and sales on um, reaching or focusing on the same goals. Right. And, and one of the big challenges that has happened in the past is, you know, as I said earlier, mar- marketing is really focused on individual people and they, they call them marketing qualified leads. And, you know, their goal very often is go out and produce as many marketing qualified leads as we possibly can. Um, and, and, and sales is looking and saying, OK, well, that's interesting. But as, as Mike said, what I'm really interested in is revenue and I'm really interested in opportunities. And, and there's been this disconnect. Uh, that's occurred where, you know, marketing may provide and create a lot of marketing qualified leads, but what's not very clear is the correlation or the association between these individual people that marketing is producing and and the goals of revenue and and deals that sales is really interested in. And and that's because a lot of times the, the marketing qualified lead is really a vacuum. It's, hey, I've got a person, here's Bob, here's Bob from Acme, 
go get them. Right? And and what sales doesn't understand is the whole lot of context of, you know, let, let me understand Bob, is Bob working with other people? How important is this, is this initiative? Are there others in this organization that are focused on that? And, and when I, when we look at, you know, kind of the original concept of a marketing qualified lead and, and the very siloed nature of a marketing qualified lead, that information just isn't made available to sales. And, and sales looks at it and says, gee, what do I want to invest in? What do I do, want to do? Do I want to work on these marketing qualified leads where I'm not really getting that much insight? Or do I want to focus on actually closing the deals that I'm working today? And, and very often it's, I'm going to work on closing the deals that because I think that's more productive. And, and, and so there's been a lot of disconnect on marketing goes out, produces a lot of marketing qualified leads. Sales looks at it and says, oh, that's interesting if I have time. And all of a sudden you get into this major finger pointing where marketing's like, hey, you're, I'm producing all these leads and you know, sales is like, but I'm not getting anything good. And why aren't you sending me anything good? And it becomes this finger pointing. And, and that, that's the process. And that's the issue that needs to change. It also feels like it's a moment of, hey, I'm checking a box. There's an activity that is done yep. versus how productive is the thing that is being done. Right. And so just that mind shift needs to occur to be able to move in, in this motion, right? Absolutely. It goes all the way to the top, right? Because a lot of times marketing gets rewarded for activity. And because the process isn't really good at linking activity to results, right? We just kind of say, hey, we want a whole lot of activity. And so marketing, go go produce a thousand MQLs and they can go do it and they can go spend a lot of money doing that. But what they don't understand or didn't understand in the past is of those thousand MQLs I produced, how many actually turned into revenue or, or how many helped influence uh, opportunities and, and increase my effectiveness of closing them or, or closing them faster, right? And, and, and so that's a big issue is because MQLs were essentially a silo, they didn't have a lot of insight back to the opportunity. And, and so sales is looking at, like I said, going, hey, these are interesting. It's better than nothing, but you know, I'm going to focus on the stuff that I believe is real. And, and that's the disconnect. The sales organization looks at opportunities and they know that in the vast majority of cases that those uh, decisions are being made by buying groups. Uh, so groups of buyers that uh, interact together and have a relationship together. And the individual lead really looks at just individuals. They're disconnected from that buying group. So as a, a as a sales organization, our reps need to be able to understand all the members of the buying group, what their interactions are, what their interests are. Uh, and that's really what is a, a full opportunity is having all that insight. Whereas getting individual leads gives uh, reps a limited set of information. It's not enough to go on. So they spend time and effort trying to build that on their own. Uh, and really what we want to do is accelerate the sales process by developing that information, uh, having marketing pass along a very rich opportunity with lots of insight into the interest of the, the organization of the buyer and share that with sales. So now we're accelerating the sales process. And so it sounds to me like if the buyers are buying in groups, the MQL approach wasn't really meeting their needs either. Is that fair? Right. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think primarily the reason that it was failing even buyer needs is buyers are providing lots of insight. You know, you know, you're coming in, they're interacting and every single interaction adds value. Right. And, and that value uh, could be for the buyer because I'm telling my potential you know, partner, here's what I'm interested in. Here's what my business pains are, all these different things that I'm hoping is going to tailor the conversation and make the conversation with this potential partner much better. Right. Um, but if the seller doesn't see that information or leverage that information, then they're not going to personalize their message. They're just going to you know, take you down. Like, I've got a nine touch email and you just had touch three and I'm going to give you touch four without really understanding what it is you're interested in and why. Right. And on, on the flip side for this, for the seller too, um, you know, there's so much information that is available that tells us kind of very early on in the process, Hey, you know, I've, I've got, 
five different people from Acme who are coming to the website and have consumed content and maybe another handful, three or four people are coming to the website anonymously. So we're seeing all this great information about what's going on in Acme, not just it's people from Acme, but very likely what their titles are and also what they're interested in. Right. And, and so I, I can come to sales and say, you know, we've got five people from Acme. They all are interested in our talent management solution. And we think that represent, represents a buying group of these people working together and, and being able to share that information to say, hey, here's five people that we know of that have engaged and, and consumed content from Acme relative to this topic. And there's other people coming in anonymously. Just that that critical mass of all these different signals just adds so much more insight and so much more value to sales than just, hey, here's Bob from Acme, go get him. But like the concept of buying groups is not new. The fact that organizations, enterprises have been <laughs> buying this way for quite some time, yet there's a disconnect there. Why is this persisting? Why haven't people moved in this direction faster if you know, ultimately you're going to be more in lockstep with your sales organization. More of the work that you are doing as a marketer is going to be likely appreciated and resulting in closed business. What's in the way? Oh, well, one of the things I, I think it's from the sales perspective, uh, initially what we're asking for is uh, we want leads. We look at volume. Uh, we're expecting things that are easily counted uh, and easily tracked. Uh, you know, sales leaders are held accountable. So they kind of expect everyone else in the organization is held accountable. And leads were, frankly, easy to measure. Uh, they were very easy to track, easy to put on a dashboard. Uh, and they could be generated uh, more quickly in some cases or would appear to be more quickly than what a full, rich opportunity might uh, might be generated. So really, sales leaders in that kind of old dynamic, old perspective, were holding back this concept. So the sellers were facing the idea of doing all that work then, of creating the buying group at the selling organization. So now what we're saying is, hey, let's move that up uh, up the funnel to get marketing to help do some of that engage engagement, understand the insights that are available, pull that uh, and uh, that set of buyers together, connect them together. And pass that down to sellers, uh, and, and frankly, that's a better customer experience. Uh, it's a better seller experience, and it's also more cost efficient if you think about it. You look at the resources that you're using at the top of funnel uh, have a very different cost than the resources that you're using at the middle of the funnel when you're putting you know, highly compensated sales reps uh, involved in discovery work. So let's accelerate the process in this way. And so, Jed, I think there's really two big reasons why we're, we're still doing this, right? Why, why organizations are still thinking MQLs versus kind of starting to shift the buying groups and opportunities. And uh, the, the first is technology, right? And if we look back at classic marketing automation systems and, and even, you know, the Salesforce automation systems, they have, you know, entities that are individual people, right? And in fact, the default sort of behavior in marketing automation system is I've got this individual person and I can push that person over to my Salesforce automation system and, and they have you know, leads or contacts or, or entities, records that talk about individual people too, right? And and so that that's just been inherently the behavior for probably the last 18, 20 years with marketing automation and Salesforce is just this big focus on individual people and, and not looking at more context to be able to say, you know, can for every person that I see, can understand, can I understand what account they're in, what are they interested in, and are there other people with similar characteristics, you know, coming from the same account, interested in the same solution, right? So um, that that's all changing, right? And we're seeing more and more adoption of the concept of buying groups from a technical perspective. With a lot, basically, most of the vendors now. Uh, are embracing the concept of supporting buying groups in, in one format or another, one way or another. Um, the, the other one's kind of interesting. So I did a, a survey um, back in April, right? And I, I reached out on LinkedIn and, you know, we've been evangelists of moving to buying groups and opportunities and, and we're seeing a lot of market mem momentum now moving that way. But I asked the question that says, hey, for you know, companies that are still focused on MQLs and haven't moved to an opportunity-centric process flow, uh, what's keeping you from changing? 
and, and I gave them four options. And the first one was, was basically cultural, that MQLs are sort of embedded in our culture. And the second was technology. It's just way too hard. We think it's too hard to do. Uh, the third was kind of alignment with sales. And we don't think sales will ever, ever go for shifting opportunities. And the fourth was marketers saying, we're not bought into the opportunity concept as marketers. Right? And, and what was really interesting, so the good news, no marketer said, we don't believe it. Right? All the marketers said, this makes complete sense. Um, very few people pick sales as the, the inhibitor. And in fact, sales, as Mike will, will tell us, right, sales loves the concept of if you can give me more information other than just here's Bob, if you can tell me there's four people and the level of engagement when you send me an opportunity, that's incredible. That the, we, we expected a little bit of pushback on the sales side, but the typical response we get from sales or our clients get from sales when, when, you know, the, when sales understands what it is that we want to do in building an opportunity-centric process, is typically, when can I have it, right? Um, and those meetings are short. It's when can I have it? This is information we already have, and it could be of value to me. Get it to me, right? Um, technology, as we said, it, it's becoming more and more solvable. But the number one answer by a long shot, it was like 80% of the respondents says, the reason we're not making this change right now is cultural, right? We've been telling our executives, we've been telling our board for 15, 20 years uh, that you know, we produced 1,000 MQLs last month, right? And... Uh, until I can sort of break that cultural addiction to how many MQLs, and, and, and to your point earlier, it's really how much quote unquote activity we're doing. Um, you know, while that may not and is not the best option by any way, shape or form, right? we, we have to be able to start to break that addiction and say, uh, you know, it's interesting to understand kind of the level of engagement, the level of activity we're seeing, but there's got to be better alternatives that give us better insight and actually more more sort of recognition of value than just how many MQLs did you produce last month? So how have you seen that cultural shift take place in in companies that you've spoken with? Is there a is there a playbook that you can map out for our listeners? What what is the first step to take if it's a if it's a cultural shift? So, so the biggest, I think the first step is getting consensus across the organization that there's a problem, right? Because there's still a lot of clients that just don't know that having an MQL centric lead centric flow um, is problematic, right? And um, so one of the things we, we've done research on is just, and, and this gets people's attention big time, is looking at what's the typical success rate that we see. If I have a kind of a lead centric MQL centric flow, uh, what, what's the what's the success rate? If 100 people come to my, web, my website and take an action and download a white paper and turn into MQLs, what, what percent of those people will actually turn into a closed deal? And, and Melissa, I'll ask you just as a pop quiz, what, what do you think that conversion rate typically is um, you know, for people that come to, come to the website as an inquiry uh, to actually get to a closed deal? Uh, less than 1%. Less than 1%. You, you saw the notes. Yeah. But it's interesting because when I ask that question, a lot of times people will say, oh, 5%, 7%. And I was like, boy, if you were able to do that, you'd have small islands in the Caribbean named after you, right? Um, it, it really is. It's less than 1%. And, and so if you flip that around, what that's saying is I've got this, this process and this process spans marketing and, and my telequalification team and sales, and, and it fails 99% of the time. Right. So, you know, the, the only way you can describe things that get through the process and, and win is lucky, right? Because 99% of the time it fails. So, yeah, you, know, you have to recognize number one and get agreement. Yeah, we have a problem, right? And, and we really do need to make a change, right? Um, and, and then it's how do we want to define uh, the process, right? And we have uh, a framework we call the B2B revenue waterfall, and, and that helps define, here's kind of the key steps, the key handoff points, what, what describes and defines the handoff points. So we think it's a, a you know, good starting point, good framework to drive this demand management process, right? But, but then we also want to be able to look at roles and responsibilities, right? And so I've got marketing and tele and sales, and, and if I think about kind of opportunities, there's all kinds of different opportunities that could exist. They could be a new prospect and an acquisition opportunity. This is the first thing I've ever sold to that account. It might be cross-sell where I'm selling to a different buying group in the account or upsell where I'm selling something new to the existing buying group, or it might be retention, right? And, and so all of those are processes. All of those are something that I want to define and measure and optimize, but we need to get agreement on who's going to do what. If this is a brand new opportunity, 
what's marketing going to do? What's sales going to do? What's the BDR going to do? If it's a retention, that could look completely different. And so that's the other key point is, um, you know, getting consensus and changing culture based on sort of this. Is, and, and, a, and a lot of times the problem is the initial perception is marketing is just acquisition. Right. But in reality, marketing is involved in all these different opportunities and can add value. And, and, and that's the last piece is um, helping organizations understand that um, when we think about value, it's more than just getting that initial person that raised their hand to turn it into an MQL and, and then stopping our, our measurement of value based on that. But realizing that, you know, there's on average 20, 25 different interactions that are occurring in a normal buying cycle. And marketing is driving a lot of those interactions, but they're being ignored in the previous approach, right? And if I think about MQLs, we just put a lot of emphasis on one interaction as opposed to recognizing that, you know, there's interactions occurring all the way through the process. But there's always bumps in the night, right? When you're trying to do a big transformation. So what are common objections or, or um, roadblocks that you've been talking with clients about as part of this sort of transformation? Well, interesting. I mean, we we do get a lot of objections from the sales organization or the marketing organization says, "Hey, this is what my sales organization is going to worry about." Uh, and and the first one is that sales leaders or sales managers, even down to sales reps, are concerned with accountability. Uh, if you're talking about now populating their funnel with opportunities, they say, hey, are these opportunities that now I'm gonna be held accountable for, but yet I haven't had any engagement, I haven't qualified them, I don't know anything about it, it's just landed in my funnel. Uh, and that frankly makes them afraid right now that they're gonna be held accountable for something that they have no understanding of. So you know that tells me first is that the processes really aren't well aligned and they're not really well coordinated. Um, but there's there's other approaches there is the the idea that uh, sales has always been accountable for things that they have accepted and agreed to that they're in their funnel. And in this process, we can just create that uh, that threshold at which in uh, uh, in marketing qualified opportunity, let's call it that for now, gets uh, gets generated, created uh, and ultimately passed the sales. And now that's the part where we say, yes, we've accepted that. We consider it an opportunity within the sales funnel. That's at the point of accountability. That then sales becomes accountable. So it's full, that's a fully connected process. Uh, and uh, that eliminates, understanding that can eliminate that fear of accountability uh, for unknown opportunities. Yeah. No, another common objection is, um, Concern that, oh, so we're focused on buying groups now, right? And so you're going to wait before you send me anything. You're going to wait and maybe you'll say, hey, I need three people to engage before I send that over to sales. And so that's going to take forever and I'm going to miss out on stuff, right? Um, but in reality, it's it's actually flipped, right? Because today, before I send something to my BDR, I send something to sales, I'm waiting for one person very often to hit kind of this magical scoring threshold. And maybe that scoring threshold is two interactions or three interactions or whatever the case may be. But what they miss is the fact that there may be other people engaging. I'm getting other signals. Right. And, and so we'd love to play this little quiz game, right. Of, you know, which, which is more compelling to sales one person that comes in and downloads four white papers, right? And the bells and whistles go off. Oh boy. You know, here's an MQL um, or four people from the same account, right? Come in and download the white paper each on the same topic. So that I see four people that we, we think are interested in my talent management solution or whatever. And so Mike, I, I, I know how you answer this, but, but which is more interesting to sales, one person binging or four people from the same account coming in and gaining, you know, accessing the same similar content. It's always the broader buying group. Right? Always the broader buying group, right? And and, and so the issue is um, most lead scoring strategies today would miss that, right? If I have two touch attempts as the threshold and, you know, go back to that four people downloading one thing, 
nothing, nothing hits the radar screen. They all stay below the, below the radar screen. But what we've seen time and time again across our client base is, you know, when I see multiple different people engaging, when I'm creating a story based off of multiple signals, whether those are named individuals or even anonymous activity, you know, we've got five people coming to our website that are anonymous. They didn't come by accident, right? They're coming to research, and, and so they're adding value. And you know, I can also go buy information that says Acme is in market researching for talent management solutions. They might not have found me, but I can learn that they're in market. And, and, and so it's really the combination of those signals of, you know, somebody binging is interesting, sure, but multiple people engaging or multiple anonymous people consuming content on my site or just a factor in market – when I, those all, when I combine those signals, that really tells a really strong story and really has a significant impact on propensity. And, and what's interesting is I can get there because I'm building the story and building my threshold around these multiple different signals, um, I'm able to detect them where in the past I didn't. So all that information was happening in the past, right? People were coming to the website. We just ignored it. Right. People were in market. We maybe never bought those signals in the past. People downloaded one white paper each. We ignored them. And if they actually came back later and did something else, we probably disqualified them because they were considered duplicate leads. So, you know, our, our whole process of waiting for one person to, to hit that magical threshold and then trigger off of that actually is restrictive and, and very often slower than building the story off of multiple signals. So it, it's not a case of, you know, sales is going to be limited in what they see. They'll probably get things earlier. And for sure, because we're leveraging all of the information that we have available that exists already, uh, we're giving sales a much smarter set of information in the context of an opportunity container. And, and, and so they get it faster and it's better quality. So it's a win-win all the way around. So I want to go back to something, Mike, that you said a little bit earlier. You were talking about the concept of sort of uh, control and accountability and the point at which sales would say, OK, this is an opportunity and now I will be accountable for it. But it seems to me there's also a flip side, which is credit, right? So there's the who controls and who is accountable. But in this new opportunities based system, who gets the credit? We recently published a blog and it essentially pointed, we see a lot of organizations when they think about credit from a marketing perspective, it's how many MQLs should, did you produce or kind of its sister metric of what percent of our revenue, what percent of our pipeline came from an MQL, from marketing, right? And, and, and this blog post was talking about how that's a metric that's actually been perfectly built to get the CMO fired, right? Because what it's doing is, you know, we talked about, 20, 25 different interactions that are occurring over the lifespan of an opportunity, you know, what an MQL source strategy really points to is we're going to pick one of those activities and we're going to give all the focus, all the credit to that one interaction that might have occurred two years ago, right? A lot of people look and say, how did Bob get in our database? Well, Bob came to our database from a trade show, right? And it's been two years, but now Bob's engaged, but the system will say they came from a trade show. We'll give marketing source to a trade show that's completely irrelevant, right? So the, the, the definition of how I consider sort of marketing sourced and MQL sourced is really restrictive and, and kind of quirky to begin with, but it ignores all of the other interactions, all the other value that's occurring throughout this process. And, and it's both from a marketing perspective and a sales perspective. And you know, as Mike says, it, it, we shouldn't be being counting going, oh, we got credit because we added this person to the database. And you know, it, it was an influencer. It wasn't a decision maker. It wasn't you know, the technical evaluator, but it was a decision maker and happened to be the first one. It doesn't matter, right? What we want to do is work together as marketing and sales and drive interactions, drive engagement and worry about what we're doing collectively as a, a net organization, as opposed to what is it we did one time to create, get somebody to raise their hand that might or might not have been consequential. Right. So, and, and, and that, that goes back to the culture question, right. Of, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm completely obsessed right now with how many MQLs produced and what percent of my pipelines coming from MQLs, I have to give you a different alternative to change that culture. And, and that alternative has to be metrics that really show the true value of both the marketing and sales organization. And once I, once I do that and organizations start adopting it, then that's the instrumental way to start to change the culture. So that sounds like a, 
at least one of the steps that you would be making as part of this change, right? Like I'm sold on this concept because this sounds very compelling. Yep. And I would love to not have to share the number of MQLs that we produce on a monthly basis as a marketing leader. What are those steps that I need to be taking likely in alignment with my sales leader to make this move? I think the most important thing marketing and sales can do together to make this happen is get alignment on what it is we're trying to do, who we aiming at and why, right? And, and, and so there's a, a huge amount of interest, obviously, in accounts, right? And so a lot of our clients will get together marketing and sales and say, here's the top 100 accounts that we're focused on, right? And that's a very common approach. And, and that's a great starting point. Right. But just like an individual buyer person is not a buyer, an account is also not a buyer. Right. It, it's the buying group within the account that's the actual buyer. And so, you know, in addition to defining the accounts, what I really need to be able to understand is the opportunities that exist within those accounts. So I've got 100 accounts we're aiming at. We have the potential of selling four opportunities per account. And, and so now I've got 400 potential opportunities that I'm aligning with sales and, and marketing on. But even one step further is to, to then understand for each of those different opportunities, if I'm telling, selling a talent management solution, let's say, right, how many people are typically involved in that buying decision process and what roles, titles are they likely to have, right? And we can say, okay, well, that's, you know, a, a moderately complex solution, and so there's typically eight to 10 people involved in that buying committee. Great. That, that's wonderful to understand the size. Let's understand kind of the roles and the titles. And, and once I do that, if I know I've got, you know, 100 accounts and 400 opportunities and 10 people in the buying group, then I can define my universe as it's really these 4,000 people. Now let's go focus and, and work together to drive engagement and progression of those 4,000 people, right? So I think to, to me, that's one of the first things to do is just get alignment on accounts, opportunities, and, and the buying groups that are going to drive our revenue. Yeah, yeah, Terry, you, you and I are exactly aligned on that. It, it's having that, I, I think it's really about sales and marketing, having that conversation and agreement uh, across the, uh, the um your go-to-market segmentation. So where is it uh, that the organization wants to focus uh, their efforts and their resources? Uh, the sales need their uh, marketing's efforts focused on big accounts or small accounts, new acquisition, uh, renewals, cross-sell, upsell. What's the agreement that we have together uh, of where we should focus our resources? That's what CMOs and CSOs do is they're they decide on resource allocation. So where do we want to allocate our resources to really help generate the, uh, the opportunities, the pipeline that, that we need to, uh, to make ourselves successful? Yeah, I think that's key. So, so here's a perfect example is, you know, I may have an opportunity in an account and it's an upsell, right? And, and so I don't need to go find new people. Sales has the relationship with that buying group. They know the people what they're going to need is help on in that case is programs to talk about the value of the new offering I want to sell to that existing buying group, right? So the roles and responsibilities is sales is going to maintain the relationship and develop the relationship they have. Marketing is going to give them programs to help communicate the value of the new solution. And then sales is hopefully going to go sell it, right? Versus it may be a completely new logo and, and, Sales doesn't know anybody. We don't know anybody, right? In that case, marketing moves more to an acquisition type strategy to say, we're going to go find people. We're going to go find signals and come back to you with the insight we have. And so that that's, I think, the, the last mile, right? It, and and Mike's spot on of resources are expensive. Resources are valuable. We want to make sure we're optimizing the resources. And, and to do that, right, I want to understand where I'm going, right? The accounts, the, the opportunities of people, but then who's going to do what to go help develop them and, and, and get really precise and clear on that, right? And once I've done that, then I've got just a, a, a huge, you know, kind of leap forward in sales and marketing alignment and success. Thank you both for joining us today. Really interesting stuff. And interested to see how this uh, starts shaping up in the next couple of years for sales and marketing leaders. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Melissa. If you like what you heard today, subscribe to Forrester's What It Means podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast player. To continue the conversation, follow Forrester on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 
or drop us a note at podcast at Thanks for listening.